definitely a magical place. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, Hi, everybody. Thing, Jerry, um, too. Um, Stephen Johnson has a, a TED talk about like where the great, great ideas come from or, or good ideas. And, yeah. Uh, he talks about that too. I mean, we had the age of alcohol and then we ran it, the enlightenment happened with the age of caffeine. Yep, yep. Hey, Pete. Hey, and let's Rob, see, what's next? Yeah. yeah, what's our next beverage? There, There is a book, the, the History of the World in Six Beverages. Um, I started reading it. I, it just was not that well written, so I put it down because the concept is really, really nice. Um, howdy, everybody. The feminine aspect of OGM is MIA so far, which hurts my heart, um, but hopefully more people will show up. Um, and my heart is still hurting from all of the violence that's happening in the world. Uh, that we, we, can't, we can't recover from one uh, incident before we're off into another one. And I, I don't wanna take us into that as our topic for the day, but it's weighing very heavily on my mind. It's just way too much. Way too much. We, we are too strangely an outlier in that. Uh, like like a bizarre outlier in the same way that, that our military budget is a bizarre outlier. Wonder if those things are correlated. Um, we have not talked through a topic for today. So the floor is open uh, for suggestions, recommendations. And please take in my, take into account how you feel about previous topics we've been on, uh, where we want to steer our conversation, what is great use of our uh, time and attention. Thanks, Doug. Your dog, I think your dog was recommending a topic, actually. No, it's not me. Uh, oh, we have two dogs on the call. So oh, that's what it is. It was Doug, <clears throat> Doug Breitbart. Um, two, two dogs, uh, two dogs, one dog. Hmm. <laughs> there we go. Um, so if anybody would like to, um, start the conversation about a topic, like suggest stir the pot a little bit, that would be great. Hey, Ken. Hi, Grace. Good morning. Grace, you're not in transit. That's good. You're, uh, I'm not in transit. That's pretty good. Yeah. I'm in Louisiana, but I'm not in transit. Um, I've been thinking a lot about physical infrastructure these days, like the physical, I've been thinking about, you know, the stack in general, right? Like what are the layers of infrastructure? And the last 10 days or so I've been spending with a friend um, looking at properties and talking about creating these eco villages on the ground. And then, and, and we're so dependent on the infrastructure that we've got. I mean, even if you've got solar panels and, a satellite link it's like well all that other stuff like all that other stuff and i've been thinking about how do we as small groups of people not just as one you know one house but as multiple houses start to build up this physical infrastructure of food and electricity and internet that we can start depending on one another i feel like a lot of us have done a certain amount of prepper type stuff, but then we're individuals and not an economy. So I've been thinking a lot about that. Like what would that look like for us to collaborate from physical location to physical location in the resource management and sustainability of a, an economy? Yeah, resistance and underground, whatever you want to call that. Um Two things to add to what you just said, Grace. Uh, one is it, I immediately started thinking of Cory Doctorow's book, Walk Away, where kind of 3D printing has moved far enough into the future and we can upload our plans into the cloud and keep them there, which we could do today. Um, and so it's easy to walk away from someplace and create some new settlement, including all the goodies and you know all, all the moving parts. And in fact, every time you have to do that, you make it a little bit better because you've always been tuning your plans as you learn and as you work, and you can you can build a neuro, you can build an onsen and all kinds of sorts of things, right? But of course, that's science fiction. Um, and then, yeah. and then also, there's this huge movement now towards decentralization, decentralization of energy, water capture, other sorts of things, which hasn't doesn't seem to have percolated or permeated into infrastructure very much yet. We're not kind of there. 
but I think there's a there's a terrific promise of harnessing a bunch of those things so that local autonomy would be more of a thing. Sorry, Grace, go ahead. You know, the other thing about walk away was that the, the, the junk thrown away by the default society was so uh, so large in volume that you could create an amazing society just on the junk. And I don't think that's science fiction at this point. Exactly, exactly. Um, and and there have been a, a burst of articles. Um, uh, Doug Carmichael mentioned at, this, at the top of the call, because I mentioned I just fetched my coffee and we started talking about coffee a little bit. Um, that there were some articles in the recent days that people who drink coffee live a little longer, maybe, that it's sort of beneficial to us. Uh, and um, how do we how do we not how do we figure out how to do these all these different kinds of things? Um, so infrastructure is in the pot. Uh, anybody else want to throw uh, an ingredient in the pot or a different kind or a different topic? Or something that's been big for you recently? I was in a discussion uh, two days ago about infrastructure a bit, and the issue came up of uh, uh, carbon, <coughs> excuse me, carbon versus uh, silicon. And the view was that uh, the silicon doesn't cost us anything. And it got me thinking, how much silicon do we use uh, to do the computing that we're doing? And part of it was motivated by hearing the fact that 17% of all electricity generated in the U.S. goes to computing. So the I'm idea sorry, that there is say, an I, infrastructure I which is carbon friendly uh, it might be false. There just there is no such thing. That there is no such thing as as a uh, carbon neutral uh, infrastructure. Um, Boss, you want to jump in? Yeah, I think the the topic of decentralization um, deserves some attention because it's really important in the energy sector <clears throat> because the, the, to maintain a stable system, it needs to be redundant. Uh, same is true for, for the food supply. Um, and it requires a rethinking uh, in the way that um, support structures uh, are organized. So, for example, um, you may need to decentralize your energy system, but you will need components to build that decentralized energy system that should be, that should be produced uh, as efficiently and as central as possible. So it's, it's, a, it's a rethinking of uh, supply chains. <clears throat> thinking of building uh, the systems in component form that can be customized you know, and assembled at, at local levels, um, certainly tool for the food system. There have been a couple attempts at design for reuse uh, in different ways. And then uh, the, the second thing I wanted to put in the conversation was that there have been a bunch of articles recently, or maybe it's just that they're bunching up in my on my radar about all this stuff we've been told about recycling plastic, it's just mostly hogwash. Like extremely little plastic is recyclable, extremely little plastic gets recycled. When plastic makes it to a recycling center, every kind of plastic, in fact, is complicated and different from the other kinds of plastic. When you blend them, it screws up their use for any other use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Unless maybe you're chipping it up and pouring it into, you know, alongside asphalt into a roadbed or something, I don't know, or a playground. Uh, so uh, Nike sells a mix. I'm forgetting exactly what they call. They don't get a lot of sneakers back, but they grind them up and they make a mix that goes into athletic fields. Basically, it, it makes a nice, a cushy layer uh, for track and field, for example, which is a nice, uh, an elegant circle, but small as it goes. Uh, Gil? <clears throat> Yeah, a couple of threads. There was, a, there was a company based in the Bay Area years ago called MBA Polymers that had high-tech solutions for separating out all the different kinds of plastics uh, to provide pure fractions. I don't know what happened with it, but I can find out. Um, the, 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 the all plastics and design for reuse and recycling economy is bedeviled by the same problems as everything else we're talking about, which is that the economy is bullshit and subsidized. 
uh, and nobody pays the real costs of what they do. And so we're all incentivized to do the apparently cheapest thing without regard to what the system's impacts are. So that's a topic we could talk about someday, maybe not today. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm, uh, I, I find it hard to shake, Jerry, the topic that you raised and said, let's not talk about. Perfect. Yeah. I, and I'm not saying that I want to talk about it, but it's hard to shake it. Um, um, there was just a news item uh, late last night. I don't know if anybody saw it, that a, uh, a Berkeley High School student has been arrested uh, who was apparently attempting to recruit classmates to do a shooting and bombing at Berkeley High School. So this is not far away, you know, in some other state somewhere. This is, you know, a mile from my house. Um, and then the photographer who's been photographing families with their guns, one of his 40 photos in the book is in my background. Uh, he's made the news a bit right, lately. It's uh, a weird It's a weird art form. These people are doing like, you know, automatic weapon mandalas. Uh, well, I think, I think, there's a there's a, not a tradition, but there have been a couple other photographers who've gone around the world uh, photographing like people's household effects. And what they do is they uh, uh, I'll find the other the other guy who did this, uh, yeah. but he got he got families to put all of their household effects in front of their house and then pose yeah. with their things. So that yeah. that was a thing that existed. It, so it's, I, a, it's a gorgeous book. It's really I mean gorgeous and deeply provocative in so many different ways. In in this, so yeah, he's copying. He's maybe he's building from that tradition. But one of the photos showed somebody that had a uh, a large glassed-in room in their home filled with weapons, you know, arrayed arrayed like musical instruments. So there is something about that. Something like three percent of the population owns half the guns in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a stat in one of the articles. And I don't know if they're I don't know if they're collector fetishists or if they see themselves as the armory for the revolution or what. I don't know what they what they are. Yeah, it might just also be a hobby run amok, like people who collected stamps or coins and just went kind of crazy on it because it was so available, don't know. What's yeah. interesting also is that the photos are are jarring partly because the people are posing as if they were posing with their stamp collection or their flower collection in their garden. And it, it's completely, there's 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 no judgment in the photos. It's just, this is a family with their guns. And at the same time, it's like, OMG, somebody has that many guns. And wow, they've got that and one of those. And wait, what? Um, it's really kind of, um, and and I don't know, my dad taught me to shoot. Like, uh, I'm comfortable around guns, et cetera. Know enough not to aim a gun ever at anybody, blah, blah, blah. But there's so many people who don't have even sort of minimal training who are running out to do this. Um, which, is why, which is why the good guy with a gun notion is so crazy because uh you know you need a lot of training which brings us back and to rob elementary. Well, especially especially in a high stress situation with other people around which brings us back to rob elementary which is uh there's an argument that rob elementary proves that a good guy with a gun doesn't really do that much good um it's interesting I, that topic because it's of course a very u.s centric topic this problem isn't anywhere else yeah. but i mean i'm always curious whenever i come to this call because it's a very u.s centric call and i don't live in the u.s and haven't done for a long time and i always wonder what the heck are you guys still doing living there especially those of you who have european citizenship you know not naming names but you know like that's an interesting topic for me like what when are you gonna like what does it take for you to you know like i'm a, i'm kind of a scaredy cat right but like i know that my people have survived by running away and not by fighting whatever the state of israel may or may not be saying today you know 70 years is a very short time in the history of my people so i'm kind of interested in what does it take to have people pick up and leave and that's pretty interesting even in the context of the ukraine right so many people picked up and leave left and some of them picked up and left because hey you know i get a free visa to the west but it's really interesting like that topic my, for myself like what does it take mm -hmm. That's a great question. And that's a nice way to internationalize this very domestic conversation. Like, why the hell are we still living in this United States thing? Um, uh, Doug, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, the idea of having guns displayed is quite old. I mean, if you go to 17th century English houses or Scottish, uh, there's often a hallway that you come into with guns on the wall and heads of strange animals that were killed somewhere. 
And so one possibility of the display of guns is it's a sign of participating in power. And it has a, also the sign of participating in a class. But but I think in those places you had much more utility this much a much more utilitarian display of guns. These were guns that people actually used, uh, and the picture behind Jerry is not of guns that are actually used in the course of life. Um, also, in the article I posted, um, <clears throat> I think from the Atlantic, the article I posted to the chat, um, Gabriele, who is the photographer who went around the U.S. almost every state, said. Uh, in many houses, <clears throat> everybody said, "No, no, no! My my guns are locked away. They're they're really you know kept pretty well." And in many other houses, and I don't want to make the people I visited really angry here, guns were lying around everywhere, often loaded, and often there were mm. small, small kids around. And uh, and he said, "This is just this is just strange." Um, so uh, let's swing from Doug to Doug, Mr. Breitbart. Yeah, I. Um... I, I sort of wonder if if it would be possible to turn the telescope around mm -hmm. um, on, on sort of a macro level. There seems to have been sort of a disabling of core value instinct and judgment and discernment and um, common sense on a lived experiential whole being emotional wet basis. Um, and if you look at each one of the dysfunctions, dystopic impacts, effects, distortions, like the picture behind you, um, there, you know, there are five bodies that each human being occupies and um, if most of the warmer ones, um, the more feminine ones are disabled, um, then things float into the intellectual and the abstract, and it becomes possible to, over time, normalize the insane. <laughs> So, you know, once upon a time, there was a pandemic and everybody does everything they can do to survive, like just sort of common sense stuff. Now there's a pandemic, not so much. Like, how does that get politicized? Is sort of on its face, uh, uh, an insane um, incremental arrival, right? At a place where all this, stuff that on its face, you know, doesn't make sense, uh, is okay and acceptable. So um, I'm, I'm sort of more centered on that, like how to reawaken or reconnect on a catalytic basis, people coming to their senses, you know, getting back to a place of what they can just know by knowing um, if all of their internal capacities are up and running. Thanks, Dan. We've had um, a few conversations here about the movements and our desires to reconnect people with nature, with each other, to, to if, if only people could see that other people aren't the other, the enemy. Uh, we all need to sort out how to how to exist on the planet together. Uh, and we, I don't think we ever we've ever focused on it hard, but it's a it's a big question in, in my head. It's like uh, we managed to, and this is part of what consumerism. I have a, a few videos I put online about the effects of consumerization of our lives. And for me, when we are mere consumers whose job is to be rugged individualist, you know, this is kind of the uh, American John Wayne culture and so forth. There's a, a lovely book, Jesus and John Wayne, which I have not read, but I've read a couple of reviews of, um, which is about how the evangelical far right went far, far right with this very masculine view of what it meant to be you know, a man in, in society. Uh, but we've been separated from each other by 
e-commerce marketing and consumerism in, in a lot of ways. And that it, it broke, uh, it worked really well in concert with what capitalism was busy doing um, with sort of uh, fake abundance, which in fact, it was, you know, single use plastics, all those kinds of things are partly how you make fake abundance is you, you, you just wrap everything and fill stores and stores and stores with 12 flavors of Kit Kats or 50 flavors of Kit Kats and, and, and 50 kinds of Tide or whatever it is. Um, Klaus. Yeah, <clears throat> I think we also need to, to take in mind that uh, we are really living in two different media worlds, two different realities. Um, my, I mean, I think every family has examples of that. My cousin lost both of his kids to QAnon and Pout Boys. You know, his son is impossible to talk with anymore and he has an arsenal of weapons accumulated. You know, my wife has a middle sister who instantly after the uh, shooting, recent shooting here, uh, started posting um, uh, images of uh, of guns and, and rejection of gun control and so on on Facebook that was so offensive. I felt compelled to actually respond to it and just explain my my disgust, which resulted in a breakage you know, because the, the reality that uh, is being created by this right wing media is so powerful. You, know, you can't you can't break through it. Um, I mean, all you end up with is a is a uh, un sort of uncomfortable conversation, and this this total insistence of uh, of being right. You know, it's not guns that kill people; it's people that kill people, and so on. And so the and the the ugliness of of these discussions, you know, where and and this is like Christians. I'm pointing out, you know, the the basic idea of Christianity and and Jesus and so on is sort of counter to uh, ignoring that you just lost 19 children and two teachers you know, to, to an 18 year old kid who was able to buy a military grade weapon without any challenge, a, a kid that had uh, issues before uh, the, uh, it came to that point. So this, the, and then when you, when you look at Fox News, I'm subscribed to some places where they do analytics on, uh, on this media world there. The, the, they're putting everything instantly into, into a perspective and into a context that makes sense of why, uh, even so everything seems to be wrong, it's still right. You know? So for example, this, this court case where, and I can't think of the names right now, but this uh, uh, one guy got, uh, got cleared of uh, talking of, of uh, the, this working for Clinton and talking about Trump and the Russia engagement and so on. But in Fox News, the, they instantly blamed the jury. You know, this was a left-wing jury. So the, the, the case should have been won, but it got lost because of the jury selection. And, and so it makes it okay again that we lost this case, but uh, you no, know, it's just there, there's a reason for it. So, so you just can't think straight when you are embedded, you know, in this world. And then, and the the uh, cognitive dissonance that you're creating when you're introducing uh, a, a, a different, compelling argument basically ends up in rupturing the relationship. It doesn't solve. You know, it doesn't result in a logical discussion. So, I don't know how we can break this. But the the amazing thing is that we have you know, a public TV channel and an entire media world that fuels this, this, this conflict and that fuels this uh, dissonance where any reasonable person can look at this is distorted information, it's propaganda, and we can't stop it. We are unable to stop it. And I think that's what makes America so crazy in comparison to other countries. Mm -hmm. Um, Grace, I'm just typing in the chat. Which, what does it take, do you mean? Do you mean, what does it take just to change us to, to sort of fix this? Or do you mean- uh, What does it take for you to get up and leave? For us to get up and leave. Okay, that, that's what you meant. Um, I'm not sure all of us are convinced that leaving is the right answer. And that we, I think many of us, I will, I will try to speak broadly, but generally, many of us harbor the hope that we can actually sort of help fix this thing. And, and that's hard to do from far away. Um, I, anybody who sort of feels that way, 
raise your hand that by staying we're sort of like able to help not that many okay paul ken doug um uh, i don't think running of... away is the the answer i don't think abandoning the country is the answer you know jerry my wavy hand is not that i think i can help but i think that i have to try yeah so, way of saying what ken was saying yeah um doug the, doug b then pete but 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 i but i do often consider grace's question and and april and i now and then talk about that question as well i mean we 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 talk about it and then we're like you know we can make a difference here can i say one other thing there i've, <laughs> I've, I've talked with a friend who's in the disaster relief business about uh, about where to live um you know given grace thank you you know you know no air three months a year and earthquakes and everything else and water and so forth and his conclusion from having looked around the world is this is not a this is not a terrible place to be all risks considered so it's not an easy answer it's absolutely not an easy answer. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Doug. I, you know, I uh, uh, sort of a fundamental value belief that I hold is it's all of us or none of us. Like we're headed toward a global extinction, planets seen five previously. It doesn't care if we want to do this to ourselves. It'll roll, you know, roll the dice and start over again without us. And, um, Anything that isn't fundamentally rooted in a premise of all of us or none of us means we're going extinct. Because once you let the us versus them enter the picture and let that, the nose of that camel in the tent, you're continuing to do what we're doing now and we're going extinct. So, so that piece isn't complicated. <laughs> And, and that, you know, and when you start getting into, you know, should I be buying my two and a half acres in New Zealand for when the end of times, it's sort of like, what, 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 what are you thinking? Like, um, <laughs> the planet is going to be, you know, it's going to be an extinction level event, and it's going to take everybody out and two and a half acres in New Zealand will not be exempt. So, um, if it's all of us or none of us, then um, th the orientation to how to fix it um, also has to carry the idea that every man, woman, and child on the planet has value and, and ability to contribute. because that sort of goes hand in hand with the first premise. And the minute you start shifting into that orientation, um, it really changes the, what, you know, what, what, what the it is that, you know, we haven't figured out yet, but that uh, is needed to really shock the system and catalyze it into coming from love uh, rather than fear and fractionalism and you know, competition and power over and all the old stuff. I, I don't know whether we as a species are evolved enough to pull it off before we em emulate ourselves, but, um, you know, five and one half does the other, six and one half does the other, right? I'll, I'll be an optimist and say it's worth trying. Like that's for me. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Uh, Pete, then Paul. Um, uh, thanks, all, and thanks, Doug. Um, I I have, well, I wish I could be a little bit more. Um, I I have a kind of a flat-footed answer to Grace's question, and and I feel called to to speak it just because Grace was really interested in in the answer to the question. Um, I. Uh, very selfishly, I don't get worried. I, I'm not worried about getting shot in the United States, um, kind of because of where I live and and kind of because of the the numbers. Um, so, uh, and and meaning no disrespect to the dead or their loved ones, um, or no minimization of their loss. But 
selfishly, um, the, the, the big problem that I have with mass shootings in the US is, is actually not the deaths themselves, even though those are really tragic, it's the mind fucks after that um, of people like wringing their hands and saying, oh my God, we have to stop this, or oh my God, this is so terrible, or, or it's horrific and heartbreaking, or you know whatever the, the phrase of the day is. Psychically, that, that takes a real toll on me. Um, and if I were to move away because of gun violence in the US, it would be that. So I've, I've had to ra rationalize it, you know, over it, as they kind of get worse or they get closer together or something like that or closer geographically sometimes. Um, the, the rationalizations I have is that, okay, I live in a society that has, you know, has a God called guns um, and we offer tribute to it. Uh, and the, the tribute that we offer, kind of like Hunger Games, uh, to the God of guns is pick a random school or a random workplace or a random mall um, and you're going to die, you know, and there's some small percentage of us that die that way. Um, for me, it's not unlike the way that we think about cars. Um, cars are a, a scourge on humanity and a scourge on the United States with the way that we've got them set up, um, suburbs and freeways and, and all that kind of stuff um uh toxic pollution you know and it's a, a cost of doing business a cost of living in the united states it's just the the way that we've kind of set up our society and um you know i and and kind of the list goes on for me education is that way too the way that we do education is extremely toxic and extremely bad for our future um the way that that we um the way that we spend on military budget is just insane. Um, even though I kind of benefit from it, you know, if you step back and look at it and look at the numbers, as Jerry was saying, the, the way that we're an outlier, it's insane. Um, and, and it's not like I haven't had the experience of being elsewhere in the world. Um, Japan is the place where I've, I've been uh, to, I don't know, a couple handfuls of countries. Japan was the place where it felt super safe and I could actually feel it. It felt to me like I'm, I'm a turtle and I have this shell on my back and I could actually take my shell off and walk around and not worrying about, not worry about getting mugged, not worry about getting pickpocketed. Um, I was with a buddy and he left his computer bag on a subway platform. And, you know, a, a day later we were in touch with the police. The police were going, dude, I think you lost this bag, you know, after thousands of people, I would walk past it. And, and the, the thing that they did with it was make sure that it got closer to being found, right? Watching kids in the subway, literally six-year-old kids going back and forth to school, you know, in a subway. It's like, Poof! and then you come back to the United States and it's like, okay, I guess I got to put the shell back on. There's places in the city I go that, you know, I, I have to be concerned about being mugged or there's places where I can walk and uh, my my uh, friends who are female or my wife can't walk there at, at night because it's not safe, you know? It's a bullshit way to live. Um, but, you know, I, I've got a lot of benefits of being here too. I, I know the history. I, I, I pretty much know the culture. I can avoid the, you know, the things that aren't safe. Um, I can try to turn off the TV or not listen uh, when we get into some, you know, ranting back and forth about whether or not we're going to do anything this time about guns. So um, a little bit of um, a little bit of um, just uh, uh, m momentum, I guess, staying in the same place. Um, and I, you know, and another thing you get used to it too. Um, you know, I, I would be scared living in a place where there's tornadoes, but I'm not scared living in a place where there's earthquakes because I grew up with earthquakes. And, you know, I've been through a couple that were pretty scary and I survived and most people survive. So, so it's an interesting question. It, it, and and uh, I, I think about it. The, the, the times I really think about, you know, I've got to get out of this country because it's batshit insane. Um, it's when we have uh, crazy politicians in, in power. And some of us, you know, a good percentage of the country actually thinks that's a good thing when, it, when it's, you know, worst for them usually. Um, so having people, the, the more people in power who have crazy decision-making, 
makes me think about leaving more. Uh, mass gun, mass shootings do not. The, th the thing that gives me a bit of hope is that my amateur theory on a piece of what's happening to us is that half the country has been spun up into a series of fears. Uh, we will, white people are being replaced. Everything is violent and dangerous. Uh, lots of crazy people are running around and are going to kill us anyway. We better arm, our, we better harden our schools and arm our teachers, uh, and any uh, any number of things um, that are from my amateur observations again actually not true or misconstrued. I mean, white replacement theory, like uh, white people in America, are in fact, due to be the minority population any day now because that's just what's been happening. Uh, for years and years and years. Um, anyway, th there's a whole bunch of narratives there that that um, I think are a little bit back to what Doug B said. I think they're underminable through love and connection. It's just that love takes time and courage, and we're not doing enough for much of it. And um, I, we can come back to that. Uh, Paul, please. So um, I live in really, really, really red country. Um, when we go to the feed store to buy chicken feed, the, the wall behind the counter is selling AR-15. Um, and we have a batshit militia group here. We're making national news. Shasta County is the, they got three right-wing people on the board of supervisors and they fired the, the health off, public health officer. And there's going to be a primary next week to see whether those guys get thrown out or reinforced. So anyway, I, I live in very, very red country. Um, and I consider myself a rural progressive because one of my great frustrations about this whole thing is I think liberals do not really honor and understand rural people. And the classic comment I see over and over again, like New York Times and all like that, is they always comment on education level. And that the, 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 it's the uneducated people who vote for Trump and such as that. And um, the educated people are the people who are on Wall Street looting the country. And so education by itself is not a virtue and that a lot of the rural people, they might not have college education because they can't afford it, but they sure know how to run a backhoe and pull a pump and do and take care of the land. And help and, their neighbor. And they are subject to dollar generals coming into their towns and, and, and depleting the economy. And I really... Uh, I think it's so important for us to engage, to understand that other point of view and not view it as just totally off the mark. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm, I, I could rant on, but I'll stop right there. Thanks, Paul. I'm Grace. I'm hoping, is the background noise a little bit not so bad this your time? Earbuds, your earbuds are helping. Okay, cool. Changing the earbuds. Okay, so I mean, it's very interesting because um, I mean, part of this came also through the physical infrastructure because my my friend came last week and we were looking at properties to create this eco village and he and he wants residency by uh, by investment. And I know he's somebody who knows a bunch of you as well. And um and my sense really was that it was more about and neither of us spoke this out loud that it was more about. Where do we feel that we can implement our vision, like these are the, our mission in life? And a few of you spoke about that, like we feel like we can make a difference here better than there. And one of the things that he and I were talking about was um, community and living in community and a more communal attitude that they have here um, in Europe and that some of the experiments that we want to run just seem easier to do here. And I know for myself, one of the reasons I moved is I just felt I needed a more global view and I was living in this little country. So, you know, I, I really enjoy hearing that as well. Like not like it's, 
I think for a lot of us, it's not as much a personal decision, but like, where do I actually think I can make a difference? And that was really comforting to hear from a lot of you. So yeah, that was like, it's not, not just what would it take, but also like, what are my considerations and where am I, you know, where is the weight of the rest of my life going? And I think Paul spoke to that too, you know, like, okay, you know, I'm in this location where people have skills and they understand the word of being a neighbor, the word like being a neighbor to somebody else. And yeah. Thanks, Grace. That, that, that neighborliness thing is really, really important. Um, if only we had somebody on the call who was focused on neighborhood economics. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Kevin, welcome. I, I know you've missed a lot of what we were talking about, but uh, yeah. uh, we've, we've been sort of wandering around. Why does America love guns so much? Uh, Grace asked us, why are you all still living in the U.S.? Mm. Um, and then we've gone lots of other other kinds of places uh and and it feels to me like like um of, of all of us who are in these sets of conversations you were really really deeply embedded in local communities with people who don't look like you helping them establish long lasting economic uh benefit sort of uh, economic social the whole sort of the whole package uh, a piece of me is wondering like is there is there code anyone could copy and borrow to sort of fork and pull the <clears> designs <throat> you've got and go pull a walk away? Because I mentioned Cory Doctorow's book Walk Away, you know, earlier, where the instructions for running one of these things are actually available, and you just you just make them a little bit better and then go start a new a new town somewhere else because the luxury of technology lets you build and find resources wherever you want to go. That's that's like the big bet from Walk Away. Sorry, Kim, go ahead. Yeah, you know, the thing that we're seeing is the, the most easily scalable uh, architecture for creating community wealth is a multi-donor, donor, donor advice fund platform. Impact Assets raised $8.6 to do it, and you can leave it behind in any community. And we've now figured out how to leave it behind uh, led by BIPOC uh, entrepreneurs who are deeply embedded in the community, but have enough uh, financial savvy, you know, somebody with 20 years CDFI or banking experience to, to be able to run it. And then they do outreach to the uh, community foundations where you reach sort of the United Way mainstream, you know, golfing crowd kind of thing. Um, and we're finding that that infrastructure becomes super flexible. Uh, and we, we're, we're doing it here uh, in Western North Carolina, but also Indianapolis at, at the same time. And, uh, and we think we're, we're getting a, a, a template of those. And then there are things that you can share once you have that platform, right? It's, it's the railroad or whatever. And so like our community equity fund, which is really working, it raised about 3 million. It's, it's solving the problem of a friends and family funding for black and brown entrepreneurs that don't have a rich aunt or uncle. And it, it, it solves a gap that CDFIs, community development finance institutions hadn't been looking at uh, until George Floyd. And uh, we're turning it into a kit that you could have on any marketplace. It's a starter kit. Kind of. And we're finding some other things that become, uh, you know, things that can be easily replicable infrastructure if you get this group of people with this group of people. And we're finding what you know if if your cdfi doesn't do small business lending we can't come to your town so there's there's gating factors you have to have we have a community foundation here that is uh, notably stolid and we reached out to them and they, they said we have no intention of being cutting edge and i said thank you so much Jeez, usually i get three meetings with an underling in a, in a windowless room before that <laughs> i become clear that that's what you were really saying uh, mm -hmm. But there's a community foundation we're working with. And so there are pieces of infrastructure that make things really replicable. There, you know, there are kind of like, uh, if you're building railroads, there are two or three pieces that stick well together. And, and we don't have an operating system. We have multiple pieces that stick well together. It's pretty easy to sell uh, most uh, mainline church endowments uh, in the Christian church on a 5% return on... Um, preserving Black Wall Street through neighbors investing in neighbors. They can buy that. And we're working with a consortium of those endowments uh, who are saying, you know, I can, I can sell 5% to my board. 
So we're, and we're being asked to organize a fund that we're not going to do a fund, but uh, other people uh, will lead it. It'll fill a lot of these gaps and things. But we have customers who are, who are saying they want to put some money together and we're trying to, you know, we're trying to build the systemic infrastructure to make it easier to replicate, you know, because there's a bunch of genius folks who are just trying to get their stuff replicable. I guess that's the, and the marketplace is is the essential infrastructure and it doesn't cost anything. It's 1% management fee on an annual basis. And it, it enables you to build a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was looking through my notes and I found I found the community equity fund deck basically, and I'm I'm looking at the Asheville community funding kit, but I'm not I'm not figuring out where where if if you have a sort of a a nexus for the community economics neighborhood economics kit that you're talking about. Um, well, it doesn't online. exist yet. I mean, so the community equity fund is going to build a kit. The marketplace is we're in ideation next week on wireframes with. Um, somebody from OGM and Caitlin who's in this network and the folks from Eagle Market Street and, and, um, and two other guys that, have, that are bringing the first deals to the marketplace. The thing we're gonna solve locally to make us really popular um, is workforce housing. Because people who work in Asheville can't afford to live here. And those people have relationships with the affluent folks who can give us more money because they're their massage therapist who has to drive 45 miles. So there's no NIMBY uh, to solve that, and we're going to uh, do. We have a model that it worked in um, California twice of uh, workforce housing using uh, unused church space, and we're going to replicate the financial stack and the model there. And I think everybody really like it. And so we're trying to build the marketplaces to solve big problems that people talk about that they care about, and then you get them into things they care about more. You know, but we're going to start with big things that that they're, that they're that feels like a pain to everybody. Super interesting. Thank you. Uh, there's also a movement you, I'm sure you know about called Reburbia, which is trying to take back big box stores that closed down because somebody else yeah. opened the competitor or or because the company decided this was no longer a profitable neighborhood, even though they'd killed yeah. off all the local little businesses. Yeah. No, interesting. Yeah. No. So how you know there's a there's a lot of empty land that's that's reusable there's just no funding to tear it down and rebuild it or adapt it and we're going to need to do a whole lot of that just a whole yeah we've been approached by three indigenous groups to do a, a neighborhood economics about uh, essentially indian country <clears throat> but the folks from um, standing rock can't work with the folks who take community reinvestment money from wells fargo and then there's folks in the middle who can work with everybody so we're trying to see if the standing rock can stand down enough to take dirty bank money <laughs> to cause it to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're both purists and hungry and sleeping on, on, on you know, on couches. So, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks, Maybe Kevin. Solve, solve that. Okay. All right. um, as, uh, as you move further in, if I can just sort of put a pin on uh, any way we can help build a durable kit that's visible and replicable, uh, like, let us know. I think that's a really useful project for OGM and OGM. Yeah, there are, there are people starting to figure that part out. So I'd be, we'd be glad to, you know, we want to be in the network between the marketplaces. So we want to rep these kits. Your glial what? cells. Glial cells for healing community. What are glial cells? Uh, so everybody thinks it's just neurons that do all the heavy lifting in your brain. It turns out that the neurons are kind of held in place by glia. Uh, which are also kind of neurotransmitters of different kinds and play different sorts of roles. They're not just wallboard holding up neurons that do all the all the lifting for for what our brain does. So mm -hmm. um, I'll I'll post the link to Glia or or Pete will beat me to a problem okay. because I'm about to call him Michael and Gill. Well, thanks for asking. So you know I, I could go on forever as it, it seems obvious. Thanks. You'll be here all week, guys. Remember to tip the weights <laughs> That's right, exactly. Um, yeah, I was I was going to uh, speak to to Grace's question, um, and and why am I still here? And um, I think you know all the things that um, that are disturbing have become more disturbing. I mean, the fact that this country 
is set up in such a way, um, you know, in, in the existence of the electoral college and, and the way that um, state populations have shaken out um, that that we could elect or not elect, but but have um, a president Donald Trump um, and minority rule that we do um, by the Senate and even the gerrymandered House um, over representing um, pretty extreme right wing positions. The thing that I find keeps me here is the desire to push back against that and not surrender to it because this country does have such an effect on the rest of the world. And as much leverage as I can get as an ordinary person talking to ordinary people seems important. Um, I um, have, my wife and I have, um, you know, we still spend some time in Brooklyn, but we've essentially moved to a rural um, area um, north of New York City that is politically very divided, represented by, you know, somewhat moderate Republicans, but, you know, my neighbor flies a 13 star American flag and a, um, <laughs> an American, uh, a blue line American flag, the black and white flag with a blue line in it, which is a, you know, kind of blue lives matter, thin blue line um, uh, symbol, um, you know, uh, yeah, another Trump voter, very proud, loud Trump voter, not far away, still flying a 2020 flag. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm feel called compelled to be active in the, you know, the community um, uh, website and newsletter. Um, and it has me talking to the ex cop, you know, um, uh, pro pro Trump um, board president about, you know, what goes in the newsletter and, um, you know, and has him thinking about my point of view and me thinking about his point of view and like us, you know, lowering temperatures among people around us and, you know, finding a little bit of common ground and, you know, the, the elections up there become more and more closely divided and, and uh, our, our neighbor, um, congressional district uh, has a, um, a Democratic Party gay um, representative. Well, you know, we, we don't. Um, and I mean, that's leverage. It's, it's to me, to me, that's being at the point of leverage to live in Brooklyn, be registered voter in Brooklyn. I don't make a difference. And up there, I feel like I make a difference. And being in this country, trying to make a difference, given the leverage that this country has in the rest of the world, seems like a reason to stay. Um, and it may be, you know, it may be futile. We may, may be headed to hell, but I, I guess I believe that there are possibilities of change and feel like, you know, in whatever small way, it's important to engage. Um, and I, I really was, you know, resonated with some of the stuff that um, uh, Paul was saying and, you know, the, the, that there's, you know, the, the, the basket of deplorables bullshit is, is really, really, really counterproductive. Um, and, and that's not where people are coming from. And the fact that there were people who voted for Bernie in the primaries and then voted for Trump, you know, or, or then voted for Jill, Jill Stein is, you know, is another part of what's responsible um, for Trump. And I'm not saying that that would have done it by itself, though it might have. Um, but 
um, you know, we have to listen better and talk better and, and be at points, points of leverage. So that's my leverage yeah. points in the system. Um, thanks, Michael. Gil? Yeah, leverage points in the system. I've heard of that. I was going to um, respond to Kevin, but first to Michael. I, I, I strongly agree. I, th I think one of the reasons I stay here is, is, is out of loyalty to the whole, not out of loyalty to this place, <clears throat> because as this country influences the fate of the world to an enormous disproportionate and terrible degree. And so <clears throat> shifting here is part of my loyalty to the rest of the 8 billion of us. <clears throat> um, the, um, the burning supporters who voted for Trump, I think is widely misunderstood. It's not that they were inherently racist and bad, nasty, deplorable people. It's that they were pissed off at what's going on. And Bernie spoke to that and Hillary didn't and Trump did. And so there's kind of undifferentiated, unsophisticated, maybe saying, we're going to go with the guy who's going to try to break this thing up more than support for any of what, it, well, who knew what he was standing for at that point. Um, to Kevin, I think the work that Kevin is doing is enormously important, both in the specifics of the design of what they're doing and the develop and the strategy of developing replicable kits. Uh, you know, which is the way that that folks like us do scale. We don't do Silicon Valley scale of vertical hockey stick unicorn. We do scale of dispersed, horizontal, federated. Uh, so I think it's a brilliant move and uh, is you know potentially an extremely good use of OGM meta project, the capacities and interests that we have here to think about what other kits are needed, what other kits are possible, mm -hmm. where can they be prototyped, how can they be propagated. Um, you know, in the, in the work that we're doing, trying to build a, um, um, a holding company to generate ecologically grounded um, um, employee owned and community rooted companies, uh, you know, we're we're going to build an instance of that, but we're going to open source the playbooks. That's been the in instinct from the beginning in that same spirit. Um, Kevin, my question for you is, I understand why you are focusing initially on BIPOC entrepreneurs. Uh, but yeah. I, what I listened was was something exclusionary. Like, you know, I understand why to start there, but this is something that could go for all entrepreneurs of all sorts. And focusing on BIPOC entrepreneurs could fuel white disaffection. I'm sure that's not your intent or probably what's going on, but that's how I heard what you said. So could you ask yeah, more? Sure. Well, you know, um, it goes back to family wealth. Okay. The mm -hmm. average black family has under 10,000 in wealth and the average white family has 110,000. So your chances of getting friends and family funding in the white community are higher. Yeah, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of white folks who don't have rich uncles. Um, Sure. Uh, you know, but I'm working with African-American folks I've known for years who were working yeah. on that problem. Yeah. 90 percent plus. Uh, so, so like, you know, 90 percent plus of African-American businesses are sole proprietors and they can't get CDFI loans. And we fill that gap. No other sector has 90 percent plus have fewer than three employees as their main bulging demographic majority but for them it's 90 percent. it's because of the friends and family gap so just a suggestion like i said i completely understand why you want to focus there and i support it yeah totally. um there may be something in the languaging that opens up a possibility of other people taking this kid and running with it in different communities that are not oh, as yeah. they, they sure could. i mean I, I think there's no we, we did it to fill this particular yeah. gap yeah, yeah you can do it for other folks it's yeah. just that it's built for that gap you know it's built for a sole yeah. proprietor with two or three yeah. employees been around three years 50 to hundred thousand revenue totally um, totally get it i'm just inviting you to think about um, maybe the mess at some point maybe no you, you, you always better. have to as you expand you, know, you always have to be aware of fragile white folks in the room i mean for sure i mean we, we're designing in uh, access for fragile white folks all over the place and i can go into how we're doing that i mean maybe that's what we're doing workforce housing maybe because there's a business mostly, opportunity there yeah, there's mostly, you know, white, white. So, so we are a tourism place that is based on healing tourism, right? You go here and you get your crystals cracked or whatever. Uh, and uh, so those are the folks that have relationships. And those that's where we're working on workforce housing, nothing racial there at all. These are, these are, you know, teachers who can't live here. There was a story in the paper last week. So yeah, our, our big funnel is 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 to white folks who care very little. That's that's the heart of it. 
And that's why we're doing uh, equity crowdfunding aggregation. So all you want to do is just invest in local businesses. And then you can look at the other things in the marketplace. I tend to focus way down on the mission focused stuff. Stephanie mm-hmm. is really wiser. She said, you know, you can build the marketplace for those who care. I want to reach those who care just a little bit. And so mm-hmm. she's building it a, a whole lot broader. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and she's good at uh, getting things done uh, without scaring white folks. She's got a lot of experience of that. That's great. Kevin, what's her name? Stephanie Swepps in Twitty. She's, she's the founder of the, of, 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 well, the CEO of Eagle Market Streets, and we've done the fund, and she's yeah. leading in, the, in building the marketplace. And I'm, I'm kind of the scout for the marketplace, finding pipeline and stuff. No, she, um, she she is like you. I mean, she you, she she is designing in for for fragile white folks who care very little, or only care now and then. Uh, Michael, is your hand still up from before? Thanks. And Gil, you just spoke. Um, I mentioned in the chat a moment ago that hackingpastors.com might be a useful thing. And indulge me for a second in a, an amateur uh, theory, but. I think if we change the sermons in evangelical churches um, a lot, it would actually shift the country tremendously. That part part of the reason people are so fearful and on fire is that evangelical churches have gone off the deep end. Uh, and there was an interesting article recently about an evangelical who had half his congregation leave because he wasn't radical enough, and they went to another place that was sort of balling up. <clears throat> you know, it was it was uh, rolling up a lot of uh, attendees because they were willing to be radical. And and there's another thought that intrudes here, which is Democrats have forgotten how to be angry. And and I, I apologize because this thought runs contrary to the let's approach with love and patience the approach that I normally have. But I a couple a couple of of Democrats recently got really angry, including uh, the woman from the Michigan House of the Michigan uh, State Legislature, who got really really angry and. People who feel left behind feel like people who are angry are fighting for them. There's a, these things are all kind of tied together. And it's like liberals keep saying, no, let's just do taxes and build big programs and that'll fix it. And people who are skeptical don't, aren't buying that for a minute. They'd rather buy somebody who's a bull in a china shop. Uh, there's another argument nearby, which is that a lot of Bernie people went over to Trump because they were voting for a fire ship. Uh, basically, they wanted to push uh, a fire in the, in the age of sail. A fire ship is when you're in a naval battle, you take your oldest, uh, your oldest ship, you pull everything of value off it that you can, you load it up with com- more combustibles, but it's made out of pitch, tar, and rope and wood. Uh, you, light, you, you then light it on fire and sail it into the opposing fleet and hope that several ships catch fire. Um, it, it's a, actually a pretty good strategy. And so uh, Trump. One under my collection of reasons people voted for Trump is that Trump was a fire ship intentionally designed to destroy the existing system, which was rigged. And that, that's a, a fine piece of logic in my head. I'm like, I believe the system is rigged too. Um, I just wouldn't take that path. I wouldn't roll the dice on, on that particular path, but I can, I can understand it entirely. Um, so... What's the best thing we can do together? Klaus, jump in. Yeah, I mean, my, my take has been the first, the first uh, 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 step would be to help people help themselves and uh, uh, getting food and shelter you know, is the, is the uh, First thing that people that people need. So, in, instead of all this vitriol and, and hate and, and uh, uh, copy paste uh, right wing media into your Facebook page, what can you do in your community? But it it does take a support structure. You know the the uh, the the entire. Uh, I, mean, I mean, right now the big thing is farm bill, right? When I mean, everybody you know the whole is focusing on the farm bill because the farm bill puts billions of dollars into the economy, pushing everything into the wrong direction you know, towards uh, commodity cores and, and large food providers. If that money could be distributed differently, you know, so where you build community uh, uh, food systems, where you uh, 
where you can grow uh, you know, limited numbers, one acre, two acres, three acres worth of produce and, and, and have some chicken and some uh, rabbits and whatever. And, and you can monetize that you know, in the economy that would make a huge difference you know, to, to help people to, to sustain themselves. And so right now there is no hope, you know, there is no vision uh, when you are at the bottom of the economy as to where you should go and what you should be doing. So what Kevin is doing is wonderful, but it needs to be amplified. And what, what Kevin is doing, I mean, what, what many, many NGOs are doing at the ground level cannot compensate or stem against these billions of dollars that are being pushed into the, into the economy through things like the Farm bill and and and, with, uh, and, and related uh, government types of spending, so it, it requires a shift, you know, in thinking, and and instead, if we could mobilize the energy that is right now going into dividing you know, sections of the economy into mobilizing a groundswell support, and it really really starts with food and shelter. You know? Love that, thank you. Doug, Doug C. Oh, who was speaking? Now? In my community, which is basically Sonoma County in Northern California, uh, we have a world of apple orchards that got turned into vineyards. And in that process, land ownership became more concentrated. If you look at the county, there's a lot of land that's owned by the vineyards that could be used for growing vegetables. Uh, what if we had a rad radical proposal that says any land which is free and open uh, could be taken by anybody who's willing to grow vegetables on it uh, and that the old owners have no recourse? Period. Well, maybe not no recourse. Maybe they get 10% of whatever gets grown. I mean, uh, one of my favorite TEDx talks ever was an early one uh, about the town of Todd Morden, Northern England, uh, and it's about edible landscapes, how they basically planted edible foods everywhere. They called up the police station, said, mind if we change your rose bushes for, for lemon trees? And they were like, sure, thumbs up. Um, and Todd Morden became a tourist destination. It helped revitalize the city and create community. There's a whole bunch of really great things. So Doug, I'm not sure it needs to be done with a heavy hand. <clears throat> I think it it's one of many different ways to actually tip people into working together towards something they could actually do together. And you don't have to be red or blue or purple or anything to go plant like edible foods in your neighborhood. That's a lovely thing. Um, so I'm wondering how to catalyze more of that activity. I think that's a, that's a fabulous idea. And a, a piece of it is land rights, squatting rights, whatever else. Um, but we've had it. We've had little glimmers of this. Also, things like yard sharing, right? There were a couple early in the sharing economies, early uh, salad days. I don't know why it's called salad days. Um, you could say, "Hey, I've got some uh, plum trees in my backyard that I never have time to harvest. If somebody will come in and harvest them, I'll keep a few, and you can have the rest." Well, that worked out fine. Um, uh, yeah. Grace, please. Yeah, I think these are. This gets back to like it's kind of funny, like we're covering a lot of the topics that we mentioned at the beginning, right? We're getting back to this physical infrastructure, and and um, I actually think that what Kevin's doing is really a foundational thing, and you know, we're all talking about that. But I'm really curious and don't have the answer to this question together. What do we what can we do together? What is that together? Together, what is that? What is the what is the the, the mycelium that binds us, that, that connects us to one each other. And there's an interesting, I listened to uh, one of the lion's bird calls, which are you know quite long, very extremely long. And they were talking about, um, you know, and I asked this question like, how is this lion's bird meta project different than what we've been labeling game B? And one of the things I think that we're doing together, you know, this felt to me like something was like, we wanna be in a weekly call with some people we really like, right? That's why I come to this call. I don't think it's productive. It's definitely productive as well in like the traditional productive or you know capitalist productive sense. But more than that, it's like I get to be with some people who I relate to as, you know, m my people. 
you know, I've kind of found my people, right? Here I am with my people. And that's really an important thing and to be honest about that. Like, I don't really come to these calls to be productive, even though that is a side effect, but I come to these calls because I like you and, and, and feel comfortable and at home and, you know, kind of, and I had a little bit of a run-in with Ken because I can't believe that you actually like me and accept me. You know, like that was kind of hard for me to believe. Um, <laughs> like just as a group, right? As like that imposter syndrome, like am I really in the right group? And that's part of the togetherness. But I think there's something better, like this, the thing that, that Kevin was talking about earlier, like creating this body of knowledge that are templates, open IP and, and, and what we're doing on the matter most and like, what is that together that some people who are doing yard sharing and plum sharing and car sharing can plug into it, right? Just like we can plug into the electricity and know that they're a part of it and know that they're belonging to it. Just like I have a credit card and a passport. I think I've talked about that several times. Like with a credit card and a passport, I know I belong to a particular network. So what is that together and how do we start to bind that thing in a, you know, loop, not bind in a tight way, but, but have the, yeah, the, the circulatory system. Um, thanks, Grace. That's, that's a really nutritional um, idea in some sense, nutritive idea, sorry. Um, and, and there's kind of a, a radical expression of it maybe, which would be uh, something I call nations of choice, <clears throat> which is maybe what's happening is we're in a period where sovereign nations, the old nation state uh, are starting to kind of wane in influence and power and crypto and other sorts of things are cutting across nation state boundaries, of course, uh, but also um, I've, I've, I've sort of long wondered why is Burning Man not a nation people join? Why doesn't it have some kind of citizenship that could be completely play citizenship? It could be just, just like, hey, I've got a, I've got a Burning Man passport, and that and four bucks will get me a coffee at Starbucks. Um, but, but then slowly turning it into something meaningful, and I'll connect that to a neighboring thought, which is, um, when, when, when we use Google Docs or whatever, we're using a really powerful suite that no, that Google doesn't charge us any money to use why don't we get identity plus power tools in the hands of refugees who have nothing and who are not allowed to work in many cases and who are really, really jammed? And why don't, why don't, we, why don't we create some way to give refugees a global status or become citizens of this nation of choice uh, or one of several nations of choice where they, have, they can sort of attach value and skills and whatever to their new identity? Um, and, and I don't see that we're doing that. I, th I think that, and, and I think we're going to have more and more and more refugees, right? <clears throat> so anyway, there, there's a lot of possibility in the air, but we're not connecting the dots well enough to make these things into platforms that are causing change that are relieving the pressure on the people who are feeling the pressure of the very real crises that are in the air. Uh, Kevin, then Doug B. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. I have a question for the group. We have this uh, watershed group that was trying to look at the donut economics approach <clears throat> to our watershed. And we're in a Swannanoa River watershed and people think of themselves that way. I mean, people move here because of the mountains and the rivers and stuff. And um, <clears throat> the donut economics includes essentially the social undershoot and the ecological overshoot. And you're trying to find the living space uh, for safe living space for people on this planet. And it's getting a lot of attention and, and, and uh, people are coming. And there are two professors from across the river. We live on the river and uh, from Warren Wilson, they're the environmental professors. And they have 10 students to do a capstone project studying the watershed. And I'm just, you know, I'm kind of thinking that, and this is happening on a, you know, a little tinted pavilion out on my land that, a, you know, has water and electricity and whatever and, and bathrooms or right around. Uh, but, you know, maybe I should give it to the college. I mean, should something like, if we build a local donut economics thing that help people manage their climate change locally, and there's a particular tax <clears throat> that the town of Black Mountain has to just start paying because the river's impaired, but if they could stop their runoff, they could make their taxes go down and collectively respond to climate change. So, you know, 
and, and it's linked to people getting sick downstream in the displaced communities by the Biltmore. Um, so should that be owned by uh, some institution, some college? It has real signs of being mm-hmm. something. You know, it's going to outgrow my tent on my farm pretty soon, probably. I don't know, but should it be owned by a college? Assuming I mean, this, is, this is actually the topic of the webinar I'm working on with the Sierra Club. So I'm partnered with the Sierra Club Water Sentinels, which are focused on watershed and watershed repair. When you think that in some states, 80% of water is being used by the farm and that how many tons of nitrogen is being put you know, onto the soil, that's really the origin of this water contamination and you can't fix it until the farmer starts putting in mounds to prevent nitrate runoff uh, or it reduces the nitrate input and all of those things. That costs money. And there are a host of programs in the federal, in the farm bill, in the, in the uh, conservation component of the farm bill that do pollinator protection, putting in pollinator strips. You know, uh, they do uh, uh, nutrient enrichment and so on, with biodiversity enrichment. So there are multiple funds you know, that, are, that are geared towards fixing watersheds. Um, and water is, of course, what binds everyone. People, when you talk about climate change, that's, that's abstract, you know, there's so much noise in there. But when you talk about water and you live at, in the Lake Erie mm. area and you have algae blooms coming down every year and you have to spend millions of dollars in your community to upgrade your water filtration systems, those things resonate with people. But the core point is we can't fix this stuff until we fix the political system you know, that spends money in the wrong direction. So for example, the first thing the Trump administration was doing is to defund the conservation programs and put the money you know, into corn and soy because that's where the political power is. So, so we need to engage the political process. You know, we can't fix these things in isolation when you, when you have a system that works against you that has so much more in resources than, than any uh, community or NGO could ever muster. And, and so that's what we, what I really would, that's what, what you see this broad coalition you know, looking at the farm bill and working hyper local, you know, talking to your local member of Congress about what you need in your community. Know, to fix what is a very local problem. And when people understand that I can't, you know, I have uh, thousands of dead fish on my beach in Florida because the Mississippi River Delta pushes down all this nitrate that's flowing off the farms. Once people connect the dots on those things, then you can get the political will and action to, to respond. And without that, there is no way of, 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 uh, of fixing anything here. Thanks, Klaus. Um, Doug B. Yeah, I, you know, I'm sort of a garage mechanic in in my orientation to all of this. So, um, you know, for me, the, the, you know, the 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 dark wolf and the and the light wolf, and who wins? Everybody here is familiar with that parable, and. Um, Which, which wolf do you want to feed? And um, I've pretty much committed 100% of my energy to uh, at least my perception of the white wolf, which is what's the new that I would have manifest. And I think you know that we're we're in a birthing process, and birthing processes are really loud and messy and bloody, painful and painful, and um, but that's what's going on. And a lot of the old systems, and a lot of the old power centers, and a lot of the old stuff is barely standing up, like it's it's all revealing its vulnerabilities and its illusions and delusions and um, and misaligned values and all the rest. And 
so that question about we're all here and what you know what can we do together and i'd be really interested in i i spend all of my time uh living in a frame of emergence in the present moment like right now that's being created by me speaking <laughs> right now um and if i forget about everything in the rearview mirror and i forget about projecting into a future that doesn't exist and clear the present moment and and the operating question is what's needed like right now what's needed um and start from literally a blank sheet of paper um it's really shifting the paradigm in how we co-create together and it also is really challenging because it means everybody's got to leave all their stuff at the door that they're that you know is the center of their existence in life and everybody has to lose that addiction to projections that provides a comfort and orientation but is fundamentally illusory because it's for a future that doesn't exist yet don't know whether that'll ever converge so like new tricks, new ways of being in the moment as co-creators, um, that's where I'm spending a huge amount of, I've been spending the last bunch of years um, on. And um, the only thing that, uh, that has managed to get its nose in the tent from the past is actually ancient which is uh, the five elements um, and the five elements traditions. Um, but uh, that's just because like that, that came out of people looking at reality and nature and going, um, you know, what, what, are the, what are the ingredients of right now? So um, I share that just because um, the collective one potential collective opportunity for for uh, this group would be instead of filling it with the prevailing paradigm and everybody's initiatives and attachments and visions and solutions and and contributions um, would be to actually um, declare it a free zone to experiment and explore co-creating from a completely new orientation and um, consciousness and way of thinking about um, what do we want to manifest? So I offer that just um, as, a, as an idea. Um, I don't I don't, I don't have any attachments in my life these days to anything. Uh, and I have, don't have an attachment to that suggestion. Um, and my experience has been that it is a very challenging thing to do, especially for a bunch of people that, you know, are really brilliant and are really engaged with everything that's going on and all the efforts and all the sparks and glimmers of what might help and contribute to saving ourselves. Um, but uh, just wanted to offer that grace in response to your question of like, what might we do together? Um, and, it, you know, like, anyway. Um, Doug, thank you. Let's, um, let's empty the space for a second and sit with what you just said. Uh, and then I'd love to step in real quick uh, to engage with what you just said and then go to Pete and then we'll be pretty near the end of our time, but let's just go into silence for a bit.
Um, so, so much of what you just said resonates strongly with me. And the, the place where, the place where I think I have some difference with what you said is a place of starting with a clean slate, uh, which I think is really difficult. And I have a not very mature set of ideas around this that I, 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 I link them to beginner's mind. <clears throat> and I, I date this back to, I was a tech industry trends analyst and everybody, you know, TCP IP was showing up as a possible way to reinvent the phone system. And back in that day, we used to do long distance and pay a lot of money for it. And I carried a long distance card from MCI with me at one point in my past. And we all kind of had all these little dialing systems. And suddenly today we're like, we're sitting here in full video at zero marginal cost uh, with the cost of the data centers that are, that are helping us do this. But OMG, we've come to a completely different place. And what I meant by beginner's mind back then was, I kind of knew enough about how POTS, the plain old telephone system worked to have a good argument with somebody from the phone system. And then I understood enough about how the inner tubes worked to go, oh, wait a minute. And I was, a, I was on the advisory board to AT&T Labs when Dave Nagel was in charge of it. And at one meeting, I was like, dudes, this IP, I, voice over IP is big. It's gonna be, and the engineers were like, dude, TCP IP is just terrible for voice. It was totally not engineered to do this. And then at the next meeting, they started the meeting with a demo of voice over IP between their Willow Park, uh, Menlo Park, Willow Street and Berlin offices or something like that. And I'm like, oh, okay. But, but what I mean by, by beginner's mind is there are really a whole big batch of good ideas out there. What's, what's dangerous is seizing on the ideas and modes of being that drag us back into the ruts of the local minima that we've been in for so long that are completely dysfunctional. What's really hard is bouncing your little ball out of that local minimum uh, into some over some high energy ridge that takes like a lot of change into some new place to being that disrupts the other systems around it, but might actually lead us into a better place. And Grace, this has a lot to do with how we see money and wealth. And, and the assumptions we make about, about, uh, about value and how value is stored, whether it should be stored, like Demarage currencies say, yeah, you, when you try to store value, we, we in fact put a little hole in the bottom of that, of that container because, because money should be circulating. That's a very different way of thinking about money from the current way of thinking about money. So, so Doug, why I'm excited about a shared memory and, and sort of uh, sharing what you know and taking Kevin's work in local living economies and neighborhood economics and making a toolkit that's, that's fork and pullable uh, <clears throat> uh, so that other people can go, oh, I'm not one of those people, but I really love this plan. I, I'm gonna just go add water and stir and put it in someplace. I'm reminded of a story I heard long ago of a couple who were doing microfinance, micro savings, not microfinance. So in micro savings, the community pools money little at a time, and then they give that out to different people. It's, it's an ancient tradition, but they brought a system in someplace in the world, uh, came, back, uh, came back five years later or more to check on it, and it, their system had died. And then they were informed that 10 local villages had picked up the system and were thriving, had adapted it, had basically said, oh, well, we like that, we're gonna go use it. So it had a contagion effect, even though the original project died. Super, how do we lather, rinse, repeat on that? And that's the reason why Walkaway keeps coming up in my head is that Walkaway as, has, a, has a plot sort of arc that we can store our ideas of good design together, right? And in the meantime, I have, other thoughts that books and PDFs are where good ideas go to die because we're busy overprotecting those ideas. We don't let those ideas actually live in the world. Like the smartest humans write books and then we wrap them with DRM and make it really hard to go implement what they said or, or discuss it or debate it. It's like, what the hell is up with that? So anyway, so sorry, you raised a bunch of different complicated issues for me, but for me, I don't wanna start with a clean slate. I wanna start with beginner's mind and then go back and harvest the great stuff that's already in the world, the juicy nuggets that are out there, and then figure out how they fit better, run experiments, try to collect data, be in conversation with groups like this um, so that we can sort that shit out together. And I think that lather, rinse, repeat on that gets us someplace, right? Um, so with that, uh, Pete, then Doug C, and you all will have the last words. Uh, thanks. I wanted to, uh, because Ken, Kevin mentioned watersheds and then a river, um, I wanted to mention, um, uh, I'm at second or third hand of this, uh, Wendy Elford knows more and uh, her friend, um, 
Erin O'Donnell knows even more. She's an expert, a world expert in uh, uh, legal personhood for things like rivers and, and uh, lakes and ecosystems. And so just like a person, they now have legal rights uh, after, you know, after the process. Um, uh, and these are usually the, the water resources are connected with indigenous um, indigenous places where the river literally for tens of thousands of years has been part of the extended family. It's a family member. It's not a resource that you take advantage of. It's, you know, you live with the river, the river lives with you. So um, then bringing that into the legal system, uh, they've, there've been, it's been done successfully around the world in, in a few, few places. And so the river has a legal right to exist, a, a legal right to flow, a legal, legal right to be safe from pollution, uh, a legal right to sue your ass if you're um, impinging on its rights. Uh, so maybe that's uh, something that uh, Kevin's watershed could use. Um, I'll, put, um, uh, I'll put more links in the OGM Calls channel on Mattermost. Thanks, Pete. Mr. Carmichael. I think of this conversation as being a bit like a pile of pieces for a jigsaw puzzle. All the pieces have their integrity, but they don't fit together yet very well. We do not have a shared map of where we are, how we got here, what can happen, and what then should we do. And the lack of a map means we start out on conversations that some of us think are already dead ends, but the people who are pursuing them uh, think it's uh, the road to nirvana. Uh, so I'm going to propose that somehow in the next weeks, we think about how to have a more shared map. Um, I, palimpsests are sort of maps that got reused or something like that, or manuscripts that got reused. I'm not sure exactly what they are. Um, but it feels like that's what we need to build together. We need to build not one map with one answer, but rather a patchwork map of many answers that interact with each other, that that work together well. Um, and I don't know if palimpsest is just too wacky a word for it or if it's a bad metaphor, but that came to mind immediately. Um, anyone with last thoughts for this call? Uh, Ken, please. I have um, this thought in my head when you ask the question, what can we do together? Um, we live in a country with a lot of NIMBY. I live in Marin County, which is the capital of NIMBY, not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And I think it'd be really awesome to launch a large scale public conversation on NIMBY. What do I want in my backyard? What would I be willing to say yes to? Take the focus off of all of the, you know, uh, we don't want this, we don't want that, and really get, start to look at how do we build a culture and a society together that's going to work for the majority of us. So just that's my, my closing thought. I love it, Ken. Thank you. It's a, a great closing thought. And with that, let's go figure this thing out. It, it, I, we've been talking a long time, but it just feels like we're shaking the parts and putting more parts on the table and shaking them together. And they, they, they often click together. And that's a really good feeling. So thank you all for that. Ciao. As we say in the jungle, our river dirty. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Uh, April is giving a speech in Orlando kind of as we speak. And she's going to take a couple days and take her seven-year-old inner, inner child to Disney and Epcot. Uh, and she took, I found my t-shirt from the banana ball, which is the party that Disney employees throw every summer, 1978. Did I say that out loud? Um, when I was 18, so I found my banana ball t-shirt and she took it along just for good mojo. Uh, don't know if she'll wear it in the park or anything like that, but. Yeah, well, but, she's the master of mojo though, right? So. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Thanks everyone. Bye.